it sounds so alarmist, you almost hesitate to say it. But investigators were clear. They think they found a training camp for school shooters near the Colorado state line. They rescued 11 kids and arrested five people at a filthy compound in northern New Mexico. Marshall Zellinger explains what we have learned, including about the suspect's father's religious outburst in court. This is the compound that sheriff's deputies in New Mexico found 11 kids living in conditions they've never seen before. The deputies were searching for a missing boy from Georgia. They suspected his father, Siraj Wahaj, had brought him here about three miles from the Colorado border. The deputies found 11 other kids, but not the missing boy. Five adults now face child abuse charges. Court documents we got today show authorities believe the kids were being trained for mass shootings. According to Wahaj's affidavit, a foster parent of one of the 11 children stated Wahaj had trained the children in the use of an assault rifle in preparation for future school shootings. The affidavit for Lucas Morton, who was also arrested, details the awful conditions. No electricity or running water. Children appear to be dirty, hungry, and dressed in ragged clothing. And loaded firearms were found within easy reach of the 11 children. Morton's father explained why his son, who he hadn't talked to in eight months, was near the Colorado border. They was homesteading and they was trying to establish a peaceful community and live a peaceful life away from society. Morton's father also shouted a familiar phrase in court, Allah Akbar, which is used in many prayerful situations in the Muslim faith, but has been shouted by terror suspects in courtrooms. I said Allah Akbar, which means Allah is greater, greater than the court system, greater than America, greater than anything. And the ultimate judge is Allah. There are going to be a few more court proceedings on Friday and Monday as we learn more about what happened at that compound. And the whole reason sheriff's deputies were there in the first place, Kyle, to find that missing boy from Georgia, mm -hmm. they found the remains of a 12th child that they believed to be that boy. It's just, just too terrible to be true. Appreciate the opportunity to get some insight into the father's thinking because to people who are not familiar with the phrase Allahu Akbar, they may have only seen it on television or in the context of these terror trials, but it's a familiar phrase for a lot of families in very innocuous contexts. And there's a lot of reporting on this, that mm -hmm. it means something to a lot of families and it's been kind of hijacked in yeah. a different way that it, it doesn't mean what everybody thinks it means. Well, you heard the man say what he meant. All right, Marshall, thank you. As the public was asked to search for seven-year-old Jordan Vong missing out of Montbello, Denver police say that his body was intentionally hidden inside his home. They have arrested a 16-year-old girl in what has now become a first-degree murder case. They are not talking about whether she's related to Jordan. Neighbors are remembering him as the boy with the big smile who often played in the front yard. The boy always quick to wave hello. The fact that I found out that he was missing broke my heart. And then when they told me he died, I didn't know what to do. He went to my little sister's school. My little niece knew him, was in the same class as him. So it hurt me a lot. The community is going to gather at 7 o'clock tonight at Marie L. Greenwood Academy to remember Jordan. He would have been a second grader there this fall. If Aurora police really do have their guy, three decades after the brutal hammer attacks that killed four people in 1984, if this is the guy, well, then the DNA-based composite image is eerie. Take a look. On the left, or pardon, right here, is the DNA-based image of the killer at the time of the attacks on a woman in Lakewood and the Bennett family in Aurora. This here is what the killer might look like today. And there is your potential suspect. He's a convict in prison in Nevada. Alex Christopher Ewing is his name. I expect details from investigators on Friday. It would be tough to run this TV station if the power kept going out. Same goes for your favorite bar or your favorite theater. And while we remain properly powered in Uptown, Excel can't seem to keep the lights on. Eight hours in less than a month. Our Sonia Gutierrez is out at a bar where they're having trouble getting lit. And uh, Sonia, Sony's and these other places are frustrated they can't get straight answers from Excel. So how did you fare today? You know, Kyle, not that well. I was able to get some information, but frankly, not even Excel knows what's going on. Sony's has had a power outage yesterday, the day before that, and on Saturday. Needless to say, they're all super frustrated. Of course, I have to come in today to check it out, and I can report lights are still on. Yeah, 
12 times now. Stoney says had to close because of a power outage. Scary. We're coming up on uh, uh, our busiest time of year. And, uh, you know, we need to know that this isn't going to happen. That's the thing. Excel can't guarantee that because they have no idea what's happening. Eight outages since June 10th. Most recently, yesterday. Uh, after a while, it gets to be ridiculous. Sure, and we're throwing thousands of dollars of food away in this neighborhood alone. Neighbors like Chris Chiari aren't having it either. So I have a question for XL. We're a refund. We asked Excel for an on-camera interview, but they declined it, saying the issue wasn't big enough, that they could get in touch with their 350 customers who have been affected without the media. I don't pretend to put any blame on Excel or anything, but gosh, this is what you guys do. I would think they could figure it out. The Ogden Theater has had to delay shows because of the power outages, too. Multiple Excel crews were out today looking for a solution, but with no real timeline of when they'll figure out what's wrong and when they'll fix it. We're certainly not trying to throw anyone under the bus. We don't know really what's happening. We just want to know what's going on and know that somebody's working towards a solution to help us or give us a solution. We're happy to help ourselves. Here's the best comparison XL was able to give us to that mystery issue. Think of it as car issues. You know there's something wrong. You can hear that there's something wrong. You're not sure what it is. You take it to the shop. They don't know what it is, but you just know there's something wrong here. That's where Excel is at. They're trying to figure it out. Kyle, they're going to keep us all posted. Meanwhile, the community is trying to organize a meeting with Excel to try to get more of those answers questions. Those May, questions you, answered. you know they're up against it when you say what's going on with the power, and they say, I don't know, have you guys seen something? Holy cow. Hey, enjoy the night at the bar, Sonia. Always great having you on the program. Encouraging news to report on the Franktown firefighters who were injured when their truck rolled last night on the way to a call. One of the two has gone home from the hospital. Initially, they were both in critical condition after their fire tender and its 3,000 some gallons of water smashed through a fence and rolled. First responders then found themselves taking care of one another and processing what had happened while they simultaneously offered information to a concerned community. We each deal with these incidents in our own way. For me, I had to see the tender back on her wheels. I couldn't just leave that incident like that. So for me, I just had to know that she's back on her wheels and our firefighters will be upright as well. No other vehicles were involved in that crash last night. State Patrol's looking into it. Colorado's oil and gas industry is building dossiers on journalists whose reporting they don't like. These attacks are compiled on a new website, which is sortable by journalists' names, where you can read the energy industry's critiques of their reporting. This site calls itself the Energy Accountability Project, but it is anything but accountable. The whole thing's anonymous. The people doing the bidding of oil and gas companies have no problem going after journalists by name, often behind the scenes producers whose names and faces aren't even known to the public. But the Energy Accountability Project hides its own identity. Who's running the site? Who is funding these attacks? Click on the About Us page and all it says is that it is sponsored by energy interests. This is some real profile and courage stuff from the oil and gas industry. Building a website attacking behind the scenes newsroom employees on behalf of your billion dollar companies while you hide in the shadows. They haven't gone after me, they haven't gone after anybody at Nine News yet, but I wanted you to know that they are now targeting other journalists in Colorado, our competitors. Listen, I have nothing against the energy industry making a case for itself. Take for instance, Western Wire. It's a project of another industry group, the Western Energy Alliance, which is based here in Denver. Now, we know that because they openly disclose that on their About Us page. And then that way, you as a reader can consider the source when reading that material. Here's the deal. Oil and gas industry is facing a difficult election season. There's the possible ballot measure to restrict drilling and a Democratic candidate for governor who's been openly hostile to the industry. But apparently they've decided that their real enemies are reporters. I imagine that this report is going to show up on the industry's anonymous attack site, and that's fine. I would just hope that this time they have the courage to sign their name. We long ago wore trails up and down our beautiful 14ers, but are we now wearing them out? And a next viewer pleads with me to stop mispronouncing the name of her favorite mountain animal. So this is less what do you say and more what did I say?
Welcome back. I'm Kathy Sabin. What a weird weather day. There was an upper air disturbance that moved across northern Colorado this morning, producing a rare early morning tornado, along with some very large hail. That weather system continues to track south out of the state. And behind it, we're left with kind of a stable and relatively dry air mass. But that tornado touching down five miles northwest of Kyoto, well, no damage or injuries reported in quite the site up there in Weld County today. Temperatures are going to continue to run a little bit below average for about another day or so, and then we're going to watch the heat return as high pressure sets up over the area. Storm track to the north of us. Moisture very limited. Isolated storms mainly along the southern foothills tonight and again tomorrow. And then basically just on our way to that much advertised warming and drying trend. Brief shower around Salida and Telluride. And that's about it. Looks nice outside tonight. Partly cloudy and isolated foothills storm. Then clearing low 61. 87 tomorrow about 10 to 20 percent chance that we'll see a foothill storm. Not much rain. And then getting close to 90 by the time we hit the weekend. And beautiful conditions heading into early next week with a little weather system back in the forecast bringing showers to the metro area on Tuesday, Kyle. Kathy, thanks. Listen, quick note, I misspoke earlier in the broadcast when I said that the crashed fire truck carried 3,000 tons of water. That would be 3,000 gallons of water. Thank you to Christopher on Twitter who caught that. 3,000 tons, that would be a pretty big truck. Onward. Colorado's tallest peaks, they call to us, perhaps too many of us. The group behind the Colorado 14ers initiative works to make sure that those mountains stay in good shape under a lot of traffic. Well, the 14ers are really the approachable Everests for people here in the lower 48. And no other state has this concentration of high peaks and the, the rugged mountains that we enjoy in the Rockies. Lloyd Athern, Executive Director, Colorado 14ers Initiative. Well, we're in my usually pile-oriented office here. We were collecting data from 20 counters last year on the, the 14ers, and we finally had a chance to download all that data and analyze it. Mount Bierstadt in a category of its own, more than 10,000 people. Over the course of the whole season, there were 334,000 people out on the 14ers. Legitimately, these are people who might get turned around by their own abilities or weather or what have you, but they're on the trail. They're providing impact on the trail, and that is really, for us, what's most important. We started in 2014 testing this infrared counter technology, and we're seeing what amounts to about a 6 to 7% steady increase. Mount Bierstadt, the data from last year showed that their peak day in mid-July was 1,300 people. I mean, that's an awful lot of people up there. That translates into a lot of impact. You know, we're all kindred spirits. We're all trying to get the same experiences there and enjoy the wonder of being out in the mountains. With our population growing, with use on the peaks growing, we need to devote ever more resources to making sure these just priceless lands are not trashed. Lloyd says there is no such thing as an easy 14er, which is really what I needed to hear when a five-year-old passed me on my way up Bierstadt. Our next YouTube channel has climbing tips from Lloyd if you're ready to take on your first 14er. While we're up there, how about we play What Do You Say? Instead of figuring out the name of a mountain range, this time it's our first ever mountain animal themed edition of the game. This little animal, Pika, Pika, kind of look like a, a mountain hamster. So I brought this up the other night when we were talking about potential mascots for the Colorado Springs minor league baseball team. And apparently this is the second time that I have mangled the pronunciation according to Bailey Lawson, who says the animal is her spirit animal and she is disappointed in me. So they're these cute little hamster sized animals that live in uh, the high alpine region, like above tree line, and they squeak. They're very cute. <laughs> I said, Pika, she says I'm wrong. So we called up Colorado Parks and Wildlife and said, what do you say? They are called the pika. So a official species name is American pika, but pika is one that they're, they're commonly known by. They really look like a guinea pig. So they're about eight inches, kind of furry little mountainous creatures. So let us know if we can solve your pronunciation questions, even if it's me who's messed it up again and again and again. Email your ideas to next at 9news.com or get our attention with the hashtag HeyNext. We return with a conversation with the woman who changed the face of Denver. Fifty years ago, a Colorado transplant had a vision. 
Dana Crawford saw something in Larimer Square that no one else did. She saw an opportunity for new development with a respect for history. Later this year, the governor will give her Colorado's highest honor, the Governor's Citizenship Medal. Steve Steger asked Dana Crawford what she makes of Denver's recent development. I became obsessed about an idea. It's safe to say we're all a bit luckier, thanks to Dana Crawford's obsession. 50 years ago, as urban renewal was becoming a buzzword, the bones of this country were being bulldozed and replaced. But Crawford saved and gave new life to Larimer Square. She did the same to Union Station in the Oxford Hotel, where we met in the lobby to talk about how the city continues to grow. I always like new development. I think um, that in general it really helps the whole community especially if it represents great architecture, which is hard to achieve these days. As you drive around, you see so many residents that are being built out of plywood, kind of the five-story flat roof stamped out thing that I, I don't think will have very long life, mainly because there's gonna be a big demand for additional housing and uh, a five or six-story building doesn't provide a whole lot of, of um, dwellings. I think that people in Denver are, because of the views of the mountains, they are very sensitive and anti-high-rise. And I think in a lot of areas, high-rise is okay. Her biggest piece of advice is for the planners and architects of today's development. I think for a lot of years, they have not been taught how to get the shared vision from the community where they want to build. If you just graduate with a degree in planning, you're going to kind of think that you know it. You've been encouraged to imagine what a, a place could be. I firmly believe that the people who have lived there for a long time have legitimate ideas, good ideas, and, and they, everybody feels better if they get a chance to participate. Those houses look like faces, do you see? Crawford told Steve that the city, in her opinion, has done a great job focusing on preservation for the last 50 years, and she hopes in the next 50, Denver will focus on promoting good quality contemporary architecture, the kind of stuff that, you know, people might want to preserve in the future. This next story isn't about a public servant in trouble. No, this next story is about a public servant doing the right thing. It's 99% of them do every day. Say it with me now. They are the good ones, and they're almost all good ones. The good ones at work in Wheat Ridge are issuing tickets to kids with a smile. Officer Stovall caught Roll riding his bike with a safety helmet on, and that safety ticket he received earns him a free ice cream and a lasting memory. Hey, just got an email. The anonymous people behind those oil and gas attacks on journalists in Colorado have decided to come out of the shadows. Ooh, goody. That's next. Earlier on next, I shared with you that I have a pretty dim view of a new anonymous website that's attacking journalists by name in Colorado, critical of their coverage of the oil and gas industry. Well, wouldn't you know it, during the program, got an email from the Colorado Oil and Gas Association. It acknowledges that they are the ones behind the website, which does not identify itself online. They wrote to me in part, the Energy Accountability Project is meant to provide factual information to the public and to the media covering stories concerning oil and natural gas. It is a fact check site, much like the media provides for politicians and others. With, of course, the exception being that when the media fact checks or criticizes somebody like the oil and gas industry, our name and our face is on it. We are not anonymously hiding behind a website. It's a pretty simple concept. If you're going to take money from billion dollar corporations to attack behind the scenes newsroom employees, at least have the courage, guys, to put your name on it. I'll be refreshing the site to make sure that happens tonight. See you next time.